Grace and peace to you. It's Captain Roger from the Grass Valley Corps of the Salvation Army. Thank you for joining us for our worship and study time this morning. Hey, I, I once got into a discussion with another pastor about the place for violence in a Christian's response to the world. I took the position that Jesus telling us to put down our weapons, to love our neighbors and our enemies, and only to do good to those who do evil to us means that we are not to use violence in any way. That was the belief of the church for centuries, and it should be the position we hold to in all things now. He held that all the stuff Jesus taught was okay up to a point, but once a line was crossed, we have license to harm those we believe are doing us or those we care about harm. Now, two quick notes. Uh, first, Jesus loves and treasures both of us. And second, the message today isn't about which one of us is right, or at least the fact that I'm right isn't what's important about it, all right? Now, as we went back and forth about the idea that there could be any kind of redemptive violence, he got pretty worked up after I'd pointed out that even in the Old Testament stories, there are people in hopeless-seeming situations where they turn to God instead of violence, and he cared for them and even protected them. And my friend said, well, that stuff may all be fine in Bible stories, but here in the real world, if someone is threatening my family, I'm going to do all I can to take them out. Wait, in the real world? We are both pastors. Supposedly, the truths of those Bible stories are the real world. If we believe in the God we say we believe in, and if we believe he arranged the whole Jesus thing as a way to show us that it is possible to live the way he created us to live and love the way he asked us to love, then those stories are the real world. And anything that tells us they are less than that or that they aren't enough of a guide is a fraud. The Word of God isn't intended to be an amusement we can set aside when we want to behave in a way contrary to what it teaches. It's more of a guide to thinking about how we can live to the higher standard, exhibiting greater love, building stronger bonds of community with one another and with all of our brothers and sisters who God created to live in this cosmos with us, even the ones we don't like. All right. Now, it's supposed to point us to trusting that the creator of everything is greater than any of the things that were created, no matter how we decide to use them. Today, we're going to look at a piece of the book of Acts in chapter 19. And it's a weird and humorous story, kind of, but it also tells us that we aren't the only members in God's family who have trouble just trusting him rather than trying to make the world conform to our wishes. But if it's true that God is greater than any other power, why don't we just trust in God rather than trying to control or be God? Now, in sharing this particular story the way that he does in Acts, Luke is trying to encourage us to simply trust in God. Now, for many of the early believers, miracles happened when they surrendered people and situations to God. Sometimes with results I suspect they never would have guessed possible. We're going to look at Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12 to start off this morning. And uh, I'm reading, by the way, from the New International Version, 2011 edition. If you have a different translation, your words might be a little bit different, but the meaning behind them should still be the same. Acts 19, 11 and 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Now, we've seen this kind of thing before, sort of. There were times when Jesus told someone to do something, and as they did it, a miracle happened. It was never really about the something. It was always about the faith that they put in Jesus. So, uh, Like when he told a group of men with leprosy to go show themselves to the priest as if they were healed. And then as they went, they realized they were healed. Or when he rubbed mud into a blind man's eyes and told him to go wash. And when he did, the man realized he could see. Here we've got Paul preaching every day about the power and teaching of Jesus. And some of those who hear about this are so sure that Paul really was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised that they thought they'd like to take something from him to that family member or friend who couldn't come to hear him speak. Maybe as a memento, maybe because they'd hoped some of that Jesus power might cling to the things that this agent of Jesus had been in contact with. 
So they grabbed the sweat rags that Paul used to keep perspiration from running into his eyes while he worked or spoke. Or they snagged an apron that he wore while he was working. Maybe they asked for them. Paul was probably the kind of guy who would give stuff to people when they needed it. But I think uh, given what was taken, it's more likely people are kind of like casually picking this stuff up while Paul's busy speaking. Ooh, a sweat rag. Let me get that baby home. And then they take these things to whoever they wanted to give it to, to help them. And probably to the surprise of everyone, they find that those who are sick become well. And those who they thought to be possessed by some malevolent outside being seem to have been freed from that influence. Stories of miraculous healing often leave us moderns skeptical or uncertain about what we should think, but even the kind of healing that we see and know about can seem impossible and unexpected at times. I sometimes talk about the daughter of a friend of ours who was struck down by a strep infection. One minute she was a happy, healthy little girl, and then she was in a coma in the hospital. And we prayed for days for God to do this great miracle. We expected the whole time her eyes were just going to open and her infectious laugh would ring out and joy would be restored to her family. But that didn't happen. After a week, life support was turned off and her last breath left her lifeless body behind. But her organs went to a number of other people who needed miracles. Several others received sudden and unexpected healing. Now, I'm not saying that I think the one makes up for the other or that the loss of this child is something to celebrate, but I am saying that miracles are about surrendering to the possible and that for the people in Ephesus during those years Paul was there, that meant sometimes bringing even a discarded sweat rag along with the story of Jesus to bring a new kind of hope and life that, <laughs> that couldn't have been had otherwise. Now, back in Acts 5, we saw something similar because people in Acts 5, they were like dragging their sick loved ones out so that the shadow of one of the apostles would touch them, just cross over them, and they would be healed. The, the faith that Jesus could work through his people was so great that there were healings and unclean spirits were dispelled, setting many free just from that shadow thing. Miracles seem to happen when people surrender their control to God and allow his power to work in their lives. It's when they recognize that God is greater than any other power and they put their trust in God instead of continuing to try to fix things on their own. Hmm. Which so often is the opposite of what we do, isn't it? We usually try to make things go the way we want them to go. Forcing circumstances and situations and any involved parties to follow our directions, tow our lines, to jump when we tell them to. That's why magic has always been so popular. Magic is all about control. The promise of magic is that it could be used to control the uncontrollable. <clears throat> and in Ephesus, magic was a power that many people trusted in and tried to master. It was thought that if you used the right words of power or performed the right rituals in the right ways, using the right ingredients, that you could force the natural, the supernatural, and even the gods to do what you commanded. Secret names could bind supernatural spirits or regular people to your will or cause the universe to change somehow that an illness could be broken or banished. And in the same way, people of that time believed that spirits animated many things and there were other unseen beings, helpful spirits or desecrating demons that could somehow insert themselves into humans and bring them great power or great harm. The secrets used to command the world in this way were carefully kept in scrolls and books of hidden knowledge, jealously guarded by those who practiced magic professionally. Exposing occult secrets could mean breaking the spells which relied on that secret, or it could mean opponents would realize how to defend against the powers of that charm, right? Ephesus was the center of the known world for magical practices during the time of the Acts. Now, there were so many magicians and dealers and charms and formulas and spells there that any written magical knowledge was called Ephesian writings. And every magician and miracle worker was given great respect by the people in that culture. Writings from that time, both in the Bible and from Greek and Roman sources, show that people of the day, they weren't just a bunch of superstitious primitives, the way we so often think they must have been. 
they actually, they carefully divided the world into the supernatural and the natural. And they believed that magic could kind of bridge our gaps of understanding about how things worked and could be made to then, you know, those things could be made to do our bidding. The, the same way we treat science now, frankly. In fact, just like we try to let good science overrule bad science, they would discredit magicians whose incantations and inscriptions failed to work. They would take those guys and they would burn their books and papers in the public square to shame them. And even though magicians would often use bits and pieces of many religious ceremonies to create their rituals, including using names they thought would add power or control to their spells, it was recognized that there were miracle workers like Jesus and some of his early followers who didn't involve themselves with any of those things, who just somehow things happened either because of their connection with the gods, which is what they thought about Jesus. He's connected to the, the gods or he is a, a demi God or a God himself um, or his followers because of their connection to Jesus who had this connection to God, that power just sort of flowed through them. And, so people incorporated these miracle stories into their own efforts to control the world because they thought, well, that guy can control the world. Somehow, if I can use their power, I can make things happen, right? Look at verses 13 and 14. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Now, this follows the logic of magical thinking. Jesus was reputed to have driven out evil spirits, so why not call on his name to try to do the same? And if we needed more proof of how deeply magical thinking had embedded itself into the culture of the people of Ephesus, here we've got the seven sons of a high-ranking Jewish priest bringing magic into their practices. That kind of attempt to manipulate the world was expressly forbidden by the Mosaic Covenant they were supposedly living under. They should have been trusting in God, not trying to use magic to control spiritual things. Now, notice what these guys are saying. Think about it for a second. In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. All right, so what can we know from this? We can know they're not believers. Um, they're not followers of the way because it's not how someone who knows anything about Jesus would talk, is it? They obviously think that Jesus is the power and it's his name that's doing the work, but the power of Jesus was the power of the Holy Spirit and the helper that he promised all those who followed him is the same helper, God's Holy Spirit. Acts is the whole story of how the Holy Spirit is working in the church. Luke's trying to make sure we recognize that these guys don't get it. They haven't tried to understand it. They don't know Jesus. They don't believe, and they do not have the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're just throwing Jesus's name out there like it's a, it's a weapon. Kind of like people uh, think of, I'm going to drive off a vampire by just holding up a cross, right? Now, does this sound like crazy stuff? Does this sound like a crazy thing for them to try to do? Oh, I'm going to just use, I don't believe in that Jesus guy, but I'm going to use his name. Yeah, um, just mouthing religious words in hopes that something will happen the way you want it to. That's nuts, isn't it? Hmm. So when I was a kid... I thought God couldn't hear our prayers if we didn't say, in Jesus' name, amen, at the end of everything. That's what people in my church experience always said at the end of a prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. And so I thought, oh, yeah, that's obviously, it's, it's part of the magic symbolism around this whole God thing. Now, as I got older and I learned more, I heard where Jesus said that whatever we ask for in his name, what God will do. And that's why we end prayers by saying, that in Jesus name thing, right? We're trying to compel God to do what we want by throwing the name of Jesus at him. And when I first heard that, I was right on it. Oh God, I would like a million dollars and a DeLorean in Jesus name. I was so disappointed when neither of those things materialized. Last week, I heard from someone who'd asked for prayers about a relative of theirs uh, who was uh, sick and in medical care. And they messaged to say, well, your prayers are working. So-and-so is doing better and coming home. Keep it up. 
They obviously think that prayers are working because the result they hoped for seems to be the one that's happening. But what if their loved one is still sick? What if the illness had overwhelmed the body and they had died? Would that mean our prayers didn't work? Why do we treat prayers like a magic incantation? If miracles come from surrender and magic is about control, then the way we pray is often way more about magic than about hoping for a miracle, isn't it? And asking for a million dollars in a DeLorean, it's like writing a letter to Santa, not like praying to God. I would still like a million dollars and a DeLorean, by the way. I don't know if I even fit in a DeLorean, but I'm willing to try, good heavens. You know, if you had one laying around. Now, one of the most helpful things anyone ever told me about prayer is that sometimes God says yes, sometimes no, and sometimes ask again later. And that kind of makes God sound like a magic eight ball. And I think there's really a lot more to it than that. But if I get down that rabbit trail, we're never going to get back to our story. Just gives you an idea, though, it, thinking about prayer, God's not always going to just do what you pray for. And how you pray doesn't change that. God's got a bigger picture in mind than what we may desire in our limited knowledge and feelings, right? So what happened when these guys tried to exercise a demon using the name of Jesus as a word of power instead of trusting in God's power? Well, we aren't really told if they had ever had any success with this approach before or not, but we do know that one day they came across some kind of spirit who saw right through what they were trying to do. Look at verses 15 and 16. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Magic is about trying to exert control over the uncontrollable. But God is greater than any other power. So why not put your trust in God instead of words of power or your own efforts to manipulate spiritual things to get the result that you're hoping for? What happened to these seven, no, wait, let, let's include the poor guy who's trapped by the demonic spirit too. What happened to these eight guys became a message to others that they needed to make a choice between belief and unbelief. Trusting God is the only way to live an empowered life instead of one where you're trying to wrest power from God. So let's see what happened after the demon exercised the exorcists, leaving them scrambling naked through the streets. Look at verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Uh, a drachma, uh, a silver coin, is roughly the equivalent of one day's wages. So 50,000 days wages. The word fear here is both the right and the wrong word. Um, where it, it says that uh, they were seized with fear. Uh, it, it's translated from the Greek word that Luke is using, which is phobos. It means something like reverence or respect. If you're kayaking in the ocean and a humpback whale surfaces near you, you're going to be feeling a lot of phobos. To be near something so much bigger and more powerful than you is, it's, it's awesome. Frightening, but probably not terrifying. Any fear is from the realization of how insignificant your greatest peak of strength is compared to even a casual flip of the tail of the giant beside you. This is what the believers in Ephesus are feeling when they realize that even the greatest name linked to power that they know and believe in has no power compared to the real supernatural world. When they see those exorcists were really taking the name of the Lord in vain, yeah, they suddenly 
didn't want to do that anymore. So recognizing that they were fools to be continuing to try to use magic to change the world when they were already agents of the Most High who had created the world, they brought their books and their scrolls and their charms and other magic debris and they burned it. Do you remember why I said people burned books of magic in those days? It was because they were thought to be substandard. It's because the knowledge in them wasn't effective. It's because they realized there was something better and they wanted that better instead of what they had. Do you remember the name Kyle McDonald at all? A couple of years ago, he had a red paper clip. He put a post up on Craigslist trying to trade it for something better. And a pair of women in Vancouver traded him a pen that looks like a fish, and they swapped the fish pen for a handmade doorknob, and then traded the doorknob for a camp stove, and then the stove for a 100-watt generator. And he exchanged the generator for an empty keg and a beer sign, and then traded those for a snowmobile. That was handed over for an afternoon with rock star Alice Cooper, which traded for a rare Kiss snow globe, and that went to actor-director Corbin Burnson for a part in a movie. I guess Corbin collects snow globes, so he was very excited to get this rare kiss snow globe. And finally, the town of Kipling, Saskatoon, offered a farmhouse in exchange for the role in the movie. Do you think Kyle misses his red paper clip? Probably about as much as those folks from Ephesus missed the books of magic they traded in so they could embrace their trust in God. When you get something so much better, there are no regrets. Jesus once told a story about a man who discovered a treasure in a field. And when he realized what it was, he went and sold everything he had to be able to buy that field. When you're getting something so much better, what hold does any old junk have on you? You're empowered by the better to dispose of anything that keeps you from getting it. Trusting God is empowering and it frees you from entanglements you don't need or truthfully don't even want. God is greater than any other power, greater than anything in his creation, seen or unseen. So we need to let go of all that other stuff and put our trust in God, not in our own desires or the ways of the world. Once you do that, you'll find you never want to trade back. So to, to sum up, miracles are about surrender. Well, magic is about control. Trusting God is really the only way to be empowered in this world. God is greater than any other power or person or situation. Remember that argument my friend and I were having? What it came down to was this. I said, we can and should trust God in all things, even when it's hard or frightening, because this world and everything in it were created by, belong to, and are under the command of God. And my friend said, yeah, there is a point beyond which he cannot and will not and does not plan to trust in God, but instead is going to take on things his own way. I said then, and I say now that we all need to realize that trusting in God is all that matters and that when we do so, we can face any challenge or threat or situation knowing that he is with us. His Holy Spirit is in us, and the example of Jesus can lead us through whatever is and on into eternal life in the kingdom of God. And now that I've put that to you, I'm going to let you decide what you want to do with it. I think that for most of us, trusting God is something we learn how to do a little at a time. But until we make that decision to try and go all in... Until we bring out our books of magic and add them to the burn pile. Until we decide that we are going to try to trust God in all things, not just in the things that go the way we want them to. I don't think we are really being very effective as followers of the way. How can we say it's important to follow Jesus if we will only do so when he goes our way instead of us going his? For the believers in Ephesus, there was a change that happened after this event. We're told that after this, the word of the Lord spread and grew in power. Their faith was so strong and so visible that it drew others in and they trusted in God as well. You know what I want? I want that for us. All it takes 
is a little trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you think you've got to in this world, remember, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear because God is there. You can't go anywhere God didn't get to first, right? You can't get to anywhere that God didn't make. You can't get to anywhere that God isn't in control. So go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you in the coming week. See you next time.